So thank you for referring you to Claudia to introduction. Um, yeah, we should start uh, probably the break now. So I'm sorry, instead of break, you will listen to a bit of theory. So uh, I want to share with you something uh, about uh, route towards topological antiferromagnetic spin orbitronics. It's a work uh, which we did together with Jakub, Jairo and Tomáš. Uh, Jakub is now in Max Planck and the rest affiliation is here. Uh, so what is, the, what is the main motivation? Basically, around 2003, 2004, there were happening very interesting things in solid state physics, which uh, gave rise to two streams, two modern streams of condensed matter physics. And uh, both of them are based on relativistic physics, but uh, they were growing somehow independently. So one part are Dirac quasi particles. So it appears that it, uh, certain materials, either in bulk or in surface states, you can have uh, band crossings which uh, mimic uh, particle uh, physics behavior, but st it, is just, uh, it is just emergent behavior because these particles uh, behave just effectively, as uh, this, this would be the normal particle, this horse, and this quasi-horse would be the emergent, efficient particle. So the second stream is then uh, what uh, actually the previous speaker, Jörg and Tomáš and Jairo were in the beginnings of, and this is the spinhole effect uh, family. So now several others, very interesting effects were discovered on, on this route. And uh, they share an important point, and that's uh, spin momentum locking, which is physically based on spin orbit coupling arising from the equation. And, uh, what, uh, what one can also observe in, the, in these two streams is that uh, basically most of the prospective applications in uh, the topological and Dirac quasi-particle stuff uh, are kind of logic devices. And uh, in, uh, in the spin orbitronic side, uh, these are more like memory devices. So there were, of course, attempts to search for miraculous devices, like based on gallium manganese arsenide, where you will have uh, both words together. But uh, there are problems, and one of the main problems which uh, this problem shares with superconductors is low uh, transition temperature. So it's appealing now, maybe try to uh, marry these two, these two words. So, and, uh, the, uh, so just quickly, so uh, the recent, the last the recent advances in the field of the quasi particles, uh, the, one of the recent breakthrough was that uh, actually you can have uh, these Dirac uh, quasi-particles uh, protected by certain crystalline asymmetries, which is uh, in certain sense better than in graphene, because in graphene you have, although very small uh, band gap, it's there when you include spin orbit coupling. So graphene is not a topologically protected uh, semi-metal. So th in, this, uh, in this sense, uh, this family of materials are better. This is, for instance, natrium-free bismuth. And uh, uh, the equation which describes these particles effectively is a Dirac equation. So you can have either massive or massless form, depending whether the symmetry protects or not protect. On the other hand, uh, the last recent advances in spin orbitronics include includes actually some attempts to merge already topological insulators with uh, spin orbitronics. And uh, also a huge breakthrough was recently uh, the possibility to manipulate uh, antiferromagnets. But we have seen already a lot of talks about this, so I will not dive into details. I will just mention that uh, both of this, uh, both of this uh, uh, things is not obvious whether it's possible to merge because the system which were considered uh, up to now were diverse because of the obvious reasons which I mentioned. And uh, the point is that uh, besides what I already said, it could be also very beneficial mutually because uh, in uh, the Dirac business there is, a, there is a challenging problem how to control these Dirac quasi-particles because they are connected to the intrinsic material properties like spin orbit coupling and uh, crystalline asymmetries, so this is not easy to control. And uh, vice versa, vice versa, uh, topologically protected states could lead to less dissipation in uh, spin orbitronics uh, devices. So 
you possibly can have uh, a smaller uh, switching currents, for instance. So the question is, uh, which symmetries we now need to accommodate uh, such, a, such a coexistence. And uh, interestingly, it turns out that uh, one of the starting point could be the PT symmetry. P stands for uh, spatial inversion and T for time reversal symmetry. And this is uh, for two reasons, because uh, once you have uh, the combined time reversal symmetry in uh, your system, although they both are on its own broken, you accommodate Kramer's degeneracy, so you have a double band degeneracy over the whole brilliant zone, and consequently, if somewhere for some reasons in the brilliant zone you have a crossing, these crossings will be four point degenerate, and this, this, will, this will mean that you have a, a potentially Dirac point. From uh, the perspective of nail spin orbitals, what Jakub was speaking about yesterday or uh, two days ago, uh, you can uh, the requirements to have efficient field like spin orbit torque. Jerk also explained it, why is it, why is it uh, uh, better for switching to have uh, field like torque. So you can, you can reformulate these requirements to have actually these two guys to be PT partners because then these spin polarizations are constrained, these non equilibrium spin polarizations are constrained to be opposite and commensurate. And uh, additionally, you need also non central symmetricity on this lattice. You need uh, to not, not have some different additional symmetry which would potentially kill your effect. So the question now is whether in antiferromagnets you can protect these fermions and eventually use this symmetry, this additional symmetry, uh, to tune it by rotation of staggered fields. And uh, it turns out that it's possible and uh, today I will show you that it's possible with non-symorphic symmetry. So what it is? Um, I will start with a general scheme. So imagine that you have uh, such a band crossing somewhere in the brilliant zone, and uh, this is, uh, let's say, calculation without spin orbit coupling. So you have some band crossing, and this color uh, corresponds to symmetry assignments of the eigenvalues uh, to the bands. So if you have the left situation, then after inclusion of spin orbit coupling, obviously you have hybridization, so you have a gap. If you have a, uh, the other, if you have the assignment other way around, then uh, you have a stable and protected crossing. And in terms of these non-symorphic symmetries, uh, you can basically uh, see it already in materials. This is recent work uh, uh, in uh, zirconium, uh, uh, zirconium si silicon-based materials. And uh, very recently, <coughs> from the point of theory, it uh, turns out that we have actually two kinds of uh, uh, non-symorphic symmetries, and they can be distinguished by uh, they acting on the wave function and uh, the commutator with the PT symmetry. So type one is the one where you have both these quantities dependent on the crystal momentum, but there is also a little bit more trickier one, and th this one actually, this type two, as called in the recent uh, archive paper, is uh, is uh, actually independent. Its eigenvalues are independent on crystal momentum, although uh, the commutator with PT symmetry is uh, crystal momentum dependent. And we will see that this one symmetry is actually important for our proposal. So uh, this symmetry will protect this uh, brilliant zone manifold since this commutator. So if you calculate it, you see that you have here this phase factor. And if you uh, then uh, if you then uh, figure it out when this means the proper assignment of bands, then you will, then you will arrive uh, at the condition that you need to have uh, uh, kx equals pi, which corresponds to this, uh, to this uh, plane. This symmetry would uh, protect, this is a screw symmetry, and this would protect uh, this line. This is a glide uh, mirror plane. So, this brings us to the proposal, so we have all the necessary symmetries. And now let's look at a very simplistic model. This is actually the sublattice of the copper manganese arsenic. We forget about all the other atoms, and we want to do a very simple, very simple four-band model. And uh, as uh, you can see, the first point is that really you can have a situation where you have two Dirac cones protected by this uh, glide mirror plane. The second point is that the symmetry, of course, we designed it like that. The symmetry uh, accommodates staggered uh, non-equilibrium 
uh, spin polarizations. And uh, there is a third important point, and that is that uh, once you run a current in the material, in a, now this direction, it will, uh, it will give rise to this non-equilibrium spin polarization, which will then, by this field-like torque mechanism, uh, switch your magnetization to this uh, direction. And as you see, you will switch from uh, Dirac semi-metal to uh, semiconductor. So these are these two situations. Uh, the, mod the model describing it is, is really minimalistic. We are trying <coughs> to do it very simple. So uh, you just see that uh, you have basically a second and first neighbor, first and second neighbor hopping in such lattice. And uh, then you have a spin orbit coupling according to this uh, uh, paper from Kane. And then we added uh, very simple antiferromagnetism. And for certain, although kind of artificial set of parameters, you can really get for 1000 this mirror glide plane symmetry protected Dirac crossings along this manifold as consistent with our symmetry analysis. But when you rotate it, you will really get a gap over the whole brillouin zone and you have a, a principally insulator. So it's a new way how to do metal insulator transition, which was a big issue in correlated matter, where you do it, for instance, that you change the whole phase, the crystal structure, which is connected to a lot of dissipation of energy. This, this could be potentially much, uh, much more uh, efficient. So now the question, once we understand the basic physics, is can we find this in real materials? And uh, we have chosen these materials among the one which uh, meet the symmetric criteria according uh, uh, to the point that this material was actually used to prove the spin orbit torques experimentally. So uh, we know that there it works. And uh, now we want to see whether there will be really also behaving according to the simple model, the uh, band crossings. And uh, as you can see, uh, you have se several band crossings around Fermi level. You have also some in Fermi C. And uh, if you look uh, more closely at uh, one special kind, so you have really the same situation as in the simple model. So if you are <coughs> along the x-axis, you have this red curve, and you have this one guy protected, and this one. But if you rotate, you have, you have the green curve, and you see that you have, you have gaps everywhere. Unfortunately, in this material, you have many other stains around, so it's not, uh, it's not a good candidate for uh, topological semi-metal, but it's a good candidate, for instance, to uh, prove by upper measurements that uh, spin orbit torques really work that way. So this is, this is one of the benefits of uh, this material from the perspective of fundamental physics. And then there is uh, another phase, actually, of copper manganese arsenic. It was reported uh, recently and uh, some time ago in the literature that it can have also bent uh, crossings. And uh, uh, remarkably, it happens for GGA approximation in density functional theory, whatever. It appears to happen exactly at the Fermi level. But uh, once you include, once you include uh, electronic correlations, uh, it will move slightly uh, out, of the, out of the Fermi level. So the question now is, can this material have a spin orbit torque? So you have now more sublattices, more degrees of freedom. So let's focus again just on the manganese sublattices. And as far as you can see, you have uh, these guys and these guys PT partners, so this is good. But now you need additional symmetry to connect these two guys. And it turns out that it's, again, this non-symorphic symmetry, in this case, as a screw axis in the Z direction. So what I do, I rotate uh, by pi along the Z direction, and then I, try, uh, then I move uh, by one half, zero, one half. So I will get this atom here, and then I will move it here. And this tells me that the XY component will be efficient, as uh, you can see from the analysis uh, according to the general symmetry uh, suggested by Jakub. So this is consistent with these two matrices. You can also have higher order terms, interestingly, which can even manipulate uh, the staggered order towards uh, the direction. And uh, what is the influence of this torque then on the band structure? So you can see that here you have the two interesting uh, 
uh, cones. And uh, here you see actually the whole phase diagram. So it turns out that because they are at a specific position in the Brillouin zone, the problem is kind of uh, uh, cylindrically symmetric. So the changes around the Fermi level happen just when you move from over one direction, when you have the blue situation, you have a non-trivial Dirac semi-metal with these two uh, Dirac points. And uh, you, go then, you go then through uh, this region where you have a semiconductor. This is this, is this uh, uh, magenta color. Okay? And then you end up here in the XY plane with a trivial Dirac semi-metal where, where they almost touch, but uh, they, they are not protected by any symmetry. So you can really, by rotating the staggered order and changing the symmetry of uh, your system, your magnetic symmetry, you can uh, do uh, phase transitions and topological phase transitions, which can be useful. And uh, already switching which Dirac points are active in your material uh, could lead to pronounced spin orbitronics effects, as for instance, anisotropic magnetic resistance, because you see that the, the Dirac points are here linear, but in this direction, they are more or less quadratic. So if you switch, uh, if you switch some Dirac points and you change, you change the Schrodinger electrons to Dirac electrons, your conductivity will change a lot. And the extreme situation is actually that you can go from really metallic behavior to insulating behavior. We, of course, need to look for materials with higher band gaps. But this can lead, very roughly speaking, very approximately to infinite anisotropic magnetoresistance. resistance. And anisotropic magnetoresistance, resistance, uh, as we know, was abandoned like 20, 30 years ago, mainly because of uh, Stuart's discoveries, who pushed uh, the field uh, to the direction of GMR and TMR. And the AMR, in comparison with these effects, was negligible. It was just a few percent. But now, potentially, we have a materials where this effect can be interesting, it can be strong, and it can be used to eventually used as a probe of uh, Dirac fermions in this uh, antiferromagnet with specific symmetries. And as the last slide, I want to demonstrate that actually even in metallic, so there is, you see there is a band structure of uh, these materials, these iridium manganese three based alloys. There was also several talks mentioning them for many interesting properties, basically based on their unique symmetries. And uh, our calculation by, from first principles by our coherent potential approximation for some disorder, so we are doping it with some elements, uh, we uh, revealed that we can have even such a large anisotropic magnetoresistance, resistance, which is for, for metallic system uh, really large 30%, and it can be attributed actually to simultaneous, uh, simultaneous two things. One is that uh, you have the coupled symmetry and disorder. It really depends where you place the disorder. You have to place it on the non-magnetic atoms. And then the whole system, when you, when you are trying to rotate the moments and see the changes in the resistance, then it's really robust. And the second point is that the, the disorder effectively moves your, the important vial points, which open and close Here you don't have direct points, but vial points, because the material doesn't have PT symmetry. So you have a splitting of the bands, but whatever, it's a similar from the concept of the AMA. So, so the point is that you, will, that you will arrive with some vial points close to the Fermi level. And uh, this leads uh, potentially to uh, large values. So th this means that uh, actually the gap which uh, remained from the 90s uh, in the understanding of anisotropic magnetoresistance, resistance, since there were just uh, some models from Campbell, Ferrer, and Joule, which could be applied just for certain cases of materials, uh, we can extend it by this. And now today we can understand even on uh, quantitative level, uh, this uh, ancient spin orbitronics effect from the 19th century. So by this, I uh, will conclude that, uh, interestingly, it's possible to do the electrical control of Dirac fermions by nail spin orbit torques. You can switch between topological semi-metal, topological Dirac semi-metal, and semiconductor, but you need to have these specific exciting symmetries. So thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much for the interesting talk. It's open for questions. Are there any questions? Uh, very nice talk to you, uh, The question is, we have a very small band of uh, order of couple of two meters and Do you think your topological AMR survives that uh, with this order in the samples? 
So if you go to very, very uh, low temperature, yes, and you can see actually two things which will be defined to normalize the free magnetic resistance, and that's temperature dependence, where you can, for instance, expect even change of sign. And second thing is the angular dependence, where you will have a departure at low temperature from the cosine square behavior. But uh, I have also looked meanwhile on materials which are larger than that. Basically, you can place inside business, and then you can make uh, even 0.4 electron volt and stuff like that. So this is the way where we can look for uh, uh, experimental materials for, for this kind of thing. Thank you. There's a question. Uh, maybe I have a question. So the white points really have to be at the Fermi energy to see that. This is known. And how far are they at the, from the Fermi energy? Uh, in the uh, so there, there is a man organ, and one to have a disorder. Uh, so just there is just some, some are at the Fermi energy. The rest is the random. But because MI is dominated by the Fermi energy transport, there is no Fermi C contribution. One can just analyze this and see, see how it changes uh, the pattern. And yeah, yeah, change. because this is very similar to the normal white ceiling method. So if the white ones are already 10 meter EV far, yeah, then it's this one. OK, further questions? OK, yes. Very nice question. Um, namely, it looks like that the contribution of uh, this electron, the, the uh, part of this electron, of this electron switch are close to the dark cone is uh, very low compared to other electrons at the level. So can we see these effects really for example in metal? So you have frozen at some points, mm -hmm. but other points uh, can smell this effect. Yes, so this is the point why it's not infinite, but just 30% in this case. But for, for the case of, so, so if you would have really, for instance, this large short band gap, like this 0.4 electron volt, then obviously if you will be at maybe not room temperature, but uh, low enough temperature, but not very Kelvin. <laughs> so reasonably low temperature, then you definitely will have uh, uh, much less uh, states available in the semiconducting phase. And the second point is that you even don't need this, like the most pronounced effect. It's enough to just switch the points. Because uh, if you have, for instance, for one direction of the magnetization active uh, the direct electrons, and for the, another direction of magnetization, you have active shedding of electrons. Then just this from single boson equations gives you uh, gives you different conductivity and kind of very different. different. Further questions? Okay. Okay. Can you talk about the of the two here? So it depends which way you count it, but the easiest way what it will do is when you count it uh, by some external field. In, in that way, you will have a break of the PT symmetry, and consequently, you will have a wild semi-metal phase in the permanganate arsenic. But the points uh, will be not protected because you will also kill uh, the non symorphic symmetry. So, this approximately this is that. Thank you. Uh, how do I have a question? Yeah. Uh, so, it works on that third magnet. So, what can we do with these third magnets? So, that's a good question. Uh, I didn't want it to contrast with the because actually uh, Dirac, Dirac, uh, Dirac semi-metals you cannot have uh, because you don't have the PT symmetry, but you can have wild semi-metals, so it's possible. Um, I have looked uh, till now just at the simple models, but the problem uh, seems to be that when you look at the recent Bernadix papers, you have uh, some uh, potential candidates. But these candidates are even more fragile than antiferromagnets because in antiferromagnets, due to the uh, two sublattices connection between these two sublattices, you have uh, in the in the density of states basically you can expect that between between metallic and semiconducting phase you will have some point where you will have very points in metal. But in ferromagnets there is no fundamental reason to have it. So even in these proposals by Bernadette and Hassan, you have you have uh, you have really shifted the power fermions from terminal by 0.4 electron volts or something like that. But these are noise because you can do them. I will talk about this. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So, so, so that will be maybe much better okay. answer. Okay. Thank you. Okay, further questions? Okay. If you comment to this, I think there's also another factor is that in direct cinematics you need a specific symmetry to protect the, the process, while in wild cinematics, 
arguments as you don't not need any additional symmetries because it's protected against any perturbation which has a greater inflation symmetry. So I think this is an advantage of the Dirac symmetry, of course, because by rotating the magnetic order, you can break the symmetry which protects the crossing. Well, the wild symmetry of this problem is not possible. I think that if you do that, you sense it is more, are more protected. Which usually people say is a good thing, but in this case, we are actually glad that we can yeah. break this protection. But I have one else says that it's possible from symmetric order to break even bars. So this mechanism is possible to apply to bars. It is. Okay, so. <laughs> so I think uh, we thank the speaker again and go to coffee break. <laughs>